Hello everyone, a very good morning to all and welcome to the Straits Times Smart Parenting PSLE webinar. I'm Sandra Davey from the Straits Times and I'll be the moderator for this morning session with Mr. Sung Chen Wei, MOE's Deputy Director General of Education. The topic for today is the new PSLE scoring system and how it will affect secondary school postings. Mr. Sung, before we start this discussion, allow me to share some housekeeping matters with our audience. This session will be approximately 45 minutes. For those of you who have submitted your questions, thank you. We will incorporate many of them in our discussion today. For those of you who may have questions later on, you can send them to us by clicking on the Q&A icon on your Zoom screen. To refresh your memory on the new scoring system and how it will be applied to school postings, we played a video recording just before the start of this session. For those of you who missed it, let me touch on some of the key changes so that you'll be able to follow this discussion. First, under the new scoring system, each standard level PSLE subject will be scored using eight bands known as achievement levels. Each pupil will be given AL scores from one to eight for each subject. A pupil's AL score in the four subjects will be added up for the total PSLE aggregate score, with four being the best possible score. The new AL system of broader bands is meant to be less stressful than the old T-score system as pupils do not have to chase the last mark in a bit to outperform their peers. Now, let me touch on the new posting system, in particular what happens when two students tie for a place. If two pupils of the same score vie for the last spot in the school, tiebreakers will come into play. The first tiebreaker will be based on citizenship. Singaporeans will get priority over Singapore PRs and international pupils. The next tiebreaker is a pupil's list of school choices, where a pupil who puts the school higher on the list of choices will get priority. If the tie still cannot be broken, then computerized balloting will be used. Now, Mr. Sung, would you like to say a few words on the new scoring system and on school selection and postings before I go into the questions? Thank you, Sandra. Let me uh, uh, welcome parents uh, to this webinar. I understand that many of you are parents of P6 students this year, and uh, it has been an unsettling year for many of us. Uh, whether you are taking the PSLE or not because of all these uh, COVID disruptions and uh, uh, adjustments we have to make in our lives. Now, with the PSLE behind us, I hope parents, uh, particularly those of P6 students, are now in a frame of mind to start thinking about the secondary school of choice for your child. Together, discuss with your child what secondary schools he or she would like to consider uh, in anticipation of the results that will be released uh, a few weeks later. Now, as Sandra has put it, there is a new uh, PSLE scoring system put in place to hopefully uh, bring down the stress level associated with examination results. But we know because of this change, there will also be naturally some anxiety among parents about what the new system means for their secondary school posting uh, outcomes. Now, please refer to, if you need more details, information from our SEC1 registration booklet, School Finder online portal, so that you can get a sense of um, what is the indicative cutoff score, for example, for our secondary schools based on the AL system and also some of the school cultures, programs, ethos, characteristics uh, that will be essential in your consideration of the secondary school of choice. We hope parents would uh, use the information to, um, uh, holistically and not rely just on the indicative cutoff point alone, uh, which is essential information, but unfortunately not sufficient for you to decide on a good match for your child because you need to understand your child's preference for what kind of school environment, what kind of special programs the child likes to uh, uh, consider joining and so use those information to guide you in your secondary school uh, selection uh, in time to come. I understand that later there will be breakout sessions for you to in interact more closely with some of our principals. I hope that those sessions will also bring you uh, further insights uh, into what may be helpful to you in choosing the secondary schools for your child. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sung. Uh, I think that was good advice for a lot of parents. Um, as I said, that we received many questions from parents. Uh, and uh, let, let's just go right into the questions. And as I said, I'm using these questions 
uh, to shape this discussion on the new PSLE system. Um, there were quite a few questions on the moderation of PSLE exams and if MOE uses the bell curve. It may be useful for me to read to you the, the questions we received. Um, a parent wrote in said, the new PSLE system is supposed to allow students to compete against uh, themselves, uh, not compete against them, rather than their peers the by themselves. Will there still be moderation of the results using a bell curve? If so, then won't we be back to the students competing against each other. Thank you, Sandra. Perhaps let me address the issue of the bell curve first before I talk about moderation, because okay. they are a little... Let, me, let right. me just jump in and okay. give you the questions on the bell curve. Right. Uh, another parent said, will there be bell curve normalization used in the new scoring system? Yet another question was, how will the scores be moderated for the PSLE to take into consideration the COVID situation? They want to know that as well. And Again, this parent asks, will MOE apply the bell curve? I think there's a need here to explain what exactly is exams moderation. I know in my own experience, uh, my few short years as a teacher, that at the end of the exams, we took samples of t test papers and everyone uh, who's marking will mark them. And then we'll come back to discuss uh, in case there was another interpretation of the question, which happens quite often, uh, and making sure, do we accept this answer? Is it reasonable? Is it logical? And uh, you know, sh how then should marks be given if a student takes a different interpretation? And then even while we're marking, uh, samples of papers that are already marked are remarked by another uh, marker. And then again, the idea is to ensure that the same marking standards are, are applied. Uh, perhaps you can start by explaining how MOE moderates exams, especially national exams like the PSLE. Right, thanks. Um, Sandra, so on the issue of moderation, I think some parents asked that question from the assumption that moderation process is simply adding marks to student scripts. Yeah. That's not how... Or taking uh, away. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, we, we, so we don't do that. We don't arbitrarily add marks or remove marks from students' uh, performance. Now, um, how SEAB tried to take into account some of these disruptions to learning uh, yeah, is a few fold. So first of all, even before the administration, administration of the exams, uh, parents will be aware that we have removed some common last topics from the national exam. Right. That itself is an attempt to take into account that the learning was perhaps disrupted this year, and right. so we should not expect the child to be ready for examination on the full uh, syllabus, right. right? We took right. away some topics. So that itself is helpful, okay. I think, to mitigate some of the impact of COVID. The second uh, aspect, as you have just described, is the marking process. Mm. Because uh, parents may think that there is this rigid marking scheme that we just mark uh, blindly uh, uh, to. Right. Uh, and any responses that fall outside the marking scheme are simply ignored or marked yeah. wrong. That's not the case, right? The marking process is a professional process where the markers will take up some of the student scripts uh, talk to one another right. about responses that don't seem to completely fall within the marking right. scheme and to discuss whether those responses are also valid representation right. of their mastery. Right. And if so, we will then adjust the marking script, uh, marking the uh, scheme to yeah. incorporate those uh, right. responses. But if not, then we will standardise and say that those responses don't reflect understanding that as right. we uh, deem it, and so we will not uh, accord marks. So there's this process where the markers come together at different stages. Right. to make sure that they respond to the students' uh, uh, answers right. and take into account both answers that may not have been anticipated but actually conceptually sound, or as well as to take into account the disruptions to learning and hence the expectations of what constitute that uh, understanding would right. have to also be uh, adjusted along the way. Right. So that's how uh, our exam board will try to make sure that the, the administration, the marking processes are actually able to take into account the disruptions to learning for the child. Right. On the issue of bell curve, yes. uh, uh, that's also a common misperception that parents think that there is this uh, standard bell curve that we force students' uh, uh, performance uh, uh, to fall onto this uh, bell curve. Yeah. And that's not the case. So there's no okay. quota for uh, AL1, AL1 yes. AL2 that we will somehow force fit students' right. uh, performance into. Uh, but. 
uh, there is a natural curve that students' performance fall into, and that is right. because when the exam board sets the examination, it takes great pain to set a balanced paper, right. meaning that the paper would have some challenging items, but also many uh, moderate items and yeah. also many uh, easy items, right. so that students across the full spectrum have a chance to demonstrate their level of understanding. And when we set a balanced paper yeah. with those uh, components, yeah. when the full cohort of P6 students take the paper, they typically will show a variety of performance levels. Okay. So they naturally, the performance will show some who do very well, some who, who do less well, and a lot who will do you know, uh, uh, moderately well. Okay. And so that's the, that's the bell curve, I think, right. what typically you see in an examination outcome. Right. But it's not because we have forced the student's performance to fit into a particular bell curve. In fact, as we have shared before, mm. the, the curve is not a perfect bell shape. Okay. The curve is actually skewed towards the higher mark ranges. Right. Uh, because uh, our students do well, yeah. and uh, many of them find PSLE examinations actually um, very accessible. Mm. So we have talked about almost half of them, regardless of which subjects you're looking at, almost half of them actually scoring 75 marks or better. Right. Uh, so many of them score in the very high mark range. So it's right. not a bell curve as you expect it. Right. Actually, it's skewed towards the higher mark range. But the bell curve is a natural outcome of uh, the balance paper that we set. And the exam board, again, goes to great lengths to ensure mm. that the standard of the exams doesn't change from year to year. So that okay. as a parent, as a candidate, you have assurances that uh, there is a consistent standard Right. that our, our, our candidates are put, put through. It right. doesn't mean that uh, this year you're lucky, you get an easy paper. Next year you're unlucky, you get a hard paper. It's right. SAB actually make sure that the consistency of the exam standards is there, is maintained. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, let, let's go to the question on exam standards. Um, there's a belief among parents, obviously, that our PSLE standards are set quite high, especially for the maths paper. Um, so here are the questions. Uh, uh, one parent wrote and said, our PSLE exams seem difficult. How do the standards for our PSLE exams compare to exams set for 12-year-olds in other countries? Another person who sent in a question, um, she's already of the view that MOE sets the standards high for the PSLE. She asked, what is MOE doing to manage the overall stress when the standards set, for example, the maths paper is extremely high? What does MOE hope to achieve by setting the standards so high? Thanks, Sandra. Like you said, <coughs> math papers tend to be the one that elicited a lot of these responses. Um, understandably, parents are anxious about their child being able to do well in national exams. Uh, and SEAB, again, when they set the papers, must make sure there are some difficult items. Otherwise, you are not able to see uh, really how some of the strongest students are able to, to do well uh, right. on those items. But those items are not representative of the difficult, dif difficulty level of the whole paper. Right. So when the PSRE papers are released to the public in a few months' time, you can always look at this year's paper and compare with last year or two years ago. And you see that the paper, like previous years would have some easy items, some moderate items that would not right. be uh, challenging for many of our students, for most of our students. Okay. Um, but we need some difficult items. And every year when there's um, some uh, anxiety about math items, they tend yeah. to zoom in on that couple of uh, difficult. difficult items, yeah. uh, but not taking into account there are many items that are actually quite easy for our students. Right. Um, of course, the exams take reference from the curriculum. So as the exam board doesn't test students outside of the syllabus. Right. What is tested in exams are part of the syllabus and the, and the students should have experienced it in their teaching and learning uh, journey right? For, for in, second, in primary schools. Um, whether our curriculum is pitched at too high a level for primary school students, I don't think so. Because when the curriculum and the syllabuses are reviewed by our uh, curriculum uh, specialists, right. uh, they compare with some of the um, syllabuses overseas right. to make sure that uh, you know, our teaching yeah. is age appropriate, developmentally okay. appropriate. Right. And some of you may be aware that actually our math textbooks in the primary schools are widely used overseas, yeah. um, both in UK and US, for example. Right. And uh, you will find that some of the UK and US educators, when they comment our textbooks, yeah. um, 
what is surprising to some people is that they often concluded that our textbooks cover less content than their textbooks used in the UK and US. Actually, yeah. recently in Straits Times, there's an article that talked about it, yeah. how the uh, US educator said that uh, the, our textbooks doesn't teach students uh, uh, algebra, but mm. actually in the US, uh, primary school kids are taught algebra. Right, right, right. So I don't think our syllabus is pitched too high for our students. Okay. Uh, but in terms of exam, uh, certainly there are some difficult items that are man meant to actually stretch some of our uh, very capable students. Right. But parents don't have to worry about getting every question right. That's not the intent uh, yeah. of the examination. Right. Uh, and that uh, I hope parents also feel assured that even though there are some difficult items and many items that are accessible, and the outcomes of the examinations typically, in, if you look at the past, quite mm. stable. Right. Yeah. Okay. I hope uh, that has assured some parents. Um, there were quite a few questions on whether MOE will release more detailed information on PSLE results when it comes out. Uh, these are some of the questions. Will MOE release the proportion of students with the 29 possible aggregate scores this year prior to the school selection exercise? The information, according to par the parents, will help gauge their child's chances of getting into a school of their choice. Um, another question, what's the percentage or number of students in past PSLE cohorts would have gotten a total PSLE score of four and five? And how does that translate to the number of places in IP schools after accounting for places taken up by DSA? Uh, again, the parents want some idea if uh, her child will be able to get in. Another parent, if my child ends up with a total AL score of 7 or 8, will there still be places available to him in an IP school? Mm. Thanks, Andrew. Well, <coughs> the issue of whether we should release information like... More detail. Yeah, yeah. what proportion of students yeah. get the various AL yeah. uh, or PSLE score. I, I don't think we want to do that because that seems to send rather conflicting signals to our desire to move your focus away from examination grades. Right. Uh, by releasing that information, you may have the perverse effect of then uh, raising the anxiety among parents uh, to actually expect your child to get better grades so that you can uh, mm. you know, have a, a better chance of entering some schools than uh, other students who happen to be sharing the same PSRE uh, score. Mm. But also because releasing that information doesn't help you in your school choices much. Um, because knowing how many students are scoring a PSRE score doesn't tell you what schools they will apply to. So mm. the, actually whether your child say, if someone scores a PSRE score of 13, yeah. and looking at schools with uh, indicative COP of uh, uh, 13 uh, mm. or 14, what chances do you get in getting there? Actually also depends on the choice patterns of other parents. Right, so just knowing, for example, you know, a thousand or two thousand students scoring yeah. that same AL doesn't yeah. tell you what schools they're applying to and hence doesn't give you a sense of whether your chance of getting into that particular school has been increased or decreased uh, uh, with the release of the information. So the information is not too helpful to you choosing schools. Okay. And we also want you to choose schools not based entirely on the indicative cutoff, but consider other aspects of uh, right. the educational experiences. So I think that information is probably less helpful than parents right. imagine. Um, on the issue of uh, the IP school places, yeah. uh, in the indicative cutoff point that we have simulated, and that is based on the results of uh, P6 candidate last year, as right. well as, as school choices patterns last year. Right. So this is uh, indicative. Uh, okay. And so we cannot say for sure that this year's uh, situation will be exactly the same as last year, mm -hmm. because it depends on how parents choose schools this year. But based on the simulated uh, uh, indicative cutoff point last year, uh, our IP schools uh, do not have an indicative cutoff point of four or five. And so you don't have to worry about getting perfect score or close to perfect PSRE score yeah. in order to access uh, IP schools. And IP schools in the indicative cutoff point ranges, uh, I think until nine. So yeah. even if you're looking at the PSRE score of uh, eight or nine, I think there will be IP schools uh, that will be able that you'll be able to consider. Right. Okay. Um, there were uh, there was a question on school choices. Uh, this parent uh, said that she knows that it mattered in the old scheme as well, but why has ma MOE made it count for even more in this new scheme? Uh, 
she goes on to say that I don't think it's that easy for parents to find the right fit for their child. Yeah. Um, posting, of course, in the AL system remains uh, based on academic merit. So right. students with stronger PSRE score will still have um, priority in getting into their preferred schools. Right. Um, regardless of, of course, their choice order. Choice right. order comes in when you are competing for school places with right. students with the same PSRE score. Yeah. And so when those situations arise, of course, citizenship will be the first tie-breaking yeah. uh, element. The issue of adding school choice order as a second uh, tie-breaking uh, uh, consideration is that we want to recognize that uh, the careful choices made by parents and students mm. ought to matter in the posting outcome so that uh, those who, who choose a school at a higher choice order than others, mm -hmm. if all things being equal, right. ought to be given a priority because they have expressed a stronger desire for those schools. Right. Uh, so this is a process of trying to allow uh, choices made by students and parents to matter uh, more right. in, their, in their posting outcome. But of course, right. it's, um, uh, in the context that uh, PSRE score is the same, citizenship yeah. status is the same. Right. Uh, and I think in those situations, I think parents probably can understand why we think choice order can come Should in matter. to influence outcome yeah. uh, a bit more. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, we've been trying to encourage parents to uh, consider their choices more carefully and look at various aspects, not just uh, exam results. Um, there are quite a few questions on ties for places and uh, balloting process. Uh, quite a few parents want to know, uh, since more students are likely to fall within certain aggregate bands, isn't it likely that more will qualify for the popular schools especially? And isn't it likely that there will be more ties for places this year? A uh, related question, can you explain when MOE will use computerized balloting and is it often used in previous years? Uh, does MOE expect that we will use more of it this year? Uh, and yet another parent referred to the fact that MOE had said it expects about 9 in 10 pupils will not need to undergo balloting. That means 1 in 10 will undergo balloting, of course. Um, so again, does MOE expect more than 1 in 10 this year to have to undergo balloting? Right. Um, so we, based on simulation, about one in ten students may have to go through balloting okay. in order to be allocated a school place because all the tie-breaking uh, yeah. uh, factors are, 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 are the same. But among the one in ten who need to go through computerized balloting, right. of course, you know, some, some of them will be balloting in, yeah. balloted, balloted in, some of them will be balloted out. So not all uh, that one in ten sure. will end up having to be balloted out. Too. Many of them will be balloted in. Uh, even in the previous T-score system, we do have to use computerized balloting because right. there are tying of T-scores even in the previous right. system. Uh, with the AL scoring system, is blunter, and so the likelihood of students having the same PSLE score applying to the same school mm -hmm. is higher. So right. we do expect slightly more balloting, right. but based on our simulation, it's likely to be 1 in 10. Okay. Um, of course, the caveat is, uh, a lot depends on what on school choices. choices the parents make. Right. Because if I and my friend share the same PSRE score but we apply to different schools, there is no need for us to be go through yeah. balloting to get right. into those schools, right? right? But if we apply to the same school and the school only at one place yeah. and we are both citizens, then we would have to go through computerized ba balloting. Right. So unfortunately, it's not something we can say for sure. It depends on right. parents' school choices. Okay. You know. And so this was simulated yes. based on the new scoring system, right? That's right. Okay. Um, Again, on indicative entry scores, uh, does MOE expect the indicative entry scores that you release to change much this year? For example, for IP schools, it ranges from 7 to 9. Do you think it will remain within this range? Mm. Um, the, our simulation, of course, is based on last year's candidates' yeah. uh, results and uh, school choices. Right. Uh, if this year's uh, school choices remain quite comparable as, as, a, as, a, as a cohort, of course, right. individually, some of them may make different choices, but collectively as a whole, if the choice patterns remain similar to last year, we do expect the indicative cutoff score to be very close. You okay. may see some schools having a slight change of uh, uh, cutoff point by one uh, up or down compared right. to what we have released as indicative uh, COP. Uh, but um, 
we don't expect it to be uh, uh, you know, varying more than that. Uh, again, uh, of course, uh, a lot depends on what school choices parents make. So we have to look at uh, the choice patterns mm -hmm. and the derived COP in order to know uh, whether our indicative COP last year uh, uh, predicted quite, quite well the behaviour this year. But at the moment, I think that's the only source of simulator data parents have to go with. Right. Um, and I hope um, you know, parents will find those kind of information based on what uh, we are able to come up with right. given the limited uh, uh, info we have about parent choices, right, uh, uh, will, will, will still be helpful to them. But we, we do expect the indicative COP to be fairly stable. To, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, there were quite a few questions on SAP schools and affiliated secondary schools but we kept some of them for the principal sessions uh, because we have some principals from these schools and we expect that they will be able to field quite a few of these questions. But I wanted to pose to you some of the, just one of the question on uh, SAP schools. Um, and, and this was from quite a few parents, similar uh, question. My son is keen on a particular SAP school, but he did not take up higher Chinese language in primary school. MOE has said that the last student to enter a SAP school had a score of 11 and had a pass in higher Chinese. Does my son stand a chance? Right. So, of course, admission to SAP school the, um, does not rely on the child having taken higher Chinese. Uh, it depends on uh, the PSLE score of the student. So in the example you just described, if yeah. for this particular SAP school, the last child that was admitted was uh, 11 PSLE score with right. higher Chinese uh, pass. Right. Uh, if your child happens to have, say, PSLE score 10, yeah. then of course uh, you will be admitted into the SAP schools ahead of this child with 11 and higher Chinese right. pass. So the uh, posting by PSLE score uh, comes good. first. Right. But if you happen to have PSLE score 11 yes. and have not taken higher Chinese, right. then the example they just described, yeah. the child will not be able to get admission to these SAP schools because right. the last child that was admitted have a higher Chinese pass. And higher Chinese uh, results are given posting advantage right. compared to someone without higher Chinese results if they share the same PSLE score. Right. Yeah. Okay, so your PSLE score still matters more yes. than... Okay. Um, now, quite a few on affiliated secondary schools. Uh, this parent asked, my child is in a primary school that has an affiliated secondary school. What if she were to list a non-affiliated secondary school as a first choice and her affiliated secondary school as a second choice? Does it mean that if she doesn't get into her first choice school, she will not be able to get into her affiliated secondary school? Mm. Um, give you another question on uh, affiliated secondary schools. Um, why does MOE insist that those applying for their affiliated secondary schools must list them as their first choice? Thanks, Andrew. The affiliation policy tries to strike this balance between recognizing the support uh, the community uh, and the stakeholders are given to the school in and express it in the form of giving priority in posting to primary schools affiliated to the secondary schools. Yeah, so that's, that's to recognize that very unique uh, um, community support that the affiliation, uh, the affiliated schools uh, enjoy. Um, but on the other hand, we need to balance against also the desire of non-affiliated students to gain admission into their secondary schools. So the affiliation policy tried to strike this uh, balance. Now, for students from affiliated primary schools, if they want to enjoy affiliation priority, we need them to express in the form of putting their affiliated secondary school as the first choice. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong statement that um, uh, I, I want to enjoy affiliation priority and I'm prepared to uh, put it as my first choice. Mm -hmm. If we al allow students to enjoy affiliated priority regardless of the school choices they make, even if they put it say at the sixth, the last school choice, and that child has priority to admission ahead of a child with no affiliation but much better PSLE score, I think that may not be too fair to the students without uh, right. affiliation and that association. So by saying that, uh, think through, if you really want the affiliated school, put it as a first choice, you have affiliation priority. But if you don't put it as a first choice, then you compete for admission based on your PSLE score 
uh, like any other uh, candidate. So that, that is to strike the balance between giving priority to admission uh, for right. affiliated students and recognizing the desire also of uh, students without affiliation to also join those schools. Okay, Th thank you for explaining that. Um, we have some questions that have come in uh, uh, while we were having this discussion. Um, this parent asked, if my child has an uh, achievement level score of 24, can he go to the express stream? Uh, if, if it's 24, the child won't be posted to the express stream. Right. right, because um, uh, 24, so if you are having a PSI score of up to 20, you, know, you are clearly going to be uh, posted to the express stream. If oh. you are happening, if you happen to have 21 or 22, then you are in what we call the express NA option band. You get to choose whether you want to be posted into express course or yeah. the normal academic course. But if you are in 23, 24, actually you are going to be uh, posted uh, to the NA, normal right. academic stream. Right. But because we have the subject-based banding system in place, even if the child is posted to a normal academic course, the child could take some subjects at the express level if right. the child has done well in the PSLE subjects. Okay. Uh, so you can separate the course from the subject that the child takes. The child may be in a normal academic course, but the child may be taking some express subjects because he has done well uh, right. at PSLE in those subjects. Right, okay. Um, yeah, um, another question that has just come in. Uh, again, um, parent is asking, uh, how would COVID affect PSLE results and posting? Um, I don't think it will affect the result of posting um, significantly. Okay. Uh, but of course, we'll know for sure until the exams results are processed and the posting outcomes are processed, right? We, we don't know for sure. But using last year experience, because yeah. last year's students were also affected right. by COVID, right. perhaps uh, maybe to a lesser ex extent, but mm. uh, we didn't see uh, them being affected unduly by, by COVID, whether in exam results or in their posting outcomes. So we are quite uh, uh, hopeful that this year's situation will remain the same, that mm -hmm. examination performance and posting outcomes uh, will be quite stable and, mm -hmm. and, and not um, have uh, uh, major disruptions by COVID uh, uh, being affected that we have to worry about. Okay. Uh, another question, um, this parent asking, who gets priority? My child who is placed in his second or third choice school or someone with a lower score who has put it as first choice? Yeah. So the priority will still be based on the academic results. Right. Uh, so the child with a, a lower choice of that school, but uh, a better PSLE score will actually be admitted first. So right. the choice order comes in uh, to, to influence the outcome only when you are competing with students with the same PSLE score. Right, okay. So it's still your PSLE uh, exam results that That's right. gives you uh, advantage. Um, hang on. There was also uh, quite a few questions uh, on, um, yeah, uh, due to the pandemic, many sports CCAs uh, have been suspended uh, why is DSA still applicable this year? Mm. Because DSA doesn't rely solely on uh, the national school games outcomes. Right. Uh, the DSA is a pathway that seeks to recognize a child's talent outside of your uh, you know, PSL results. Uh, and so whether it is in the area of performing arts, in the area of sports, in the area of leadership, those are aspects that schools can continue to observe even without <coughs> some national competitions. So say for okay. sports, for example, uh, you may have taken part in some competitions in previous years, even right. though if this year you, you can't do so. And even if um, you can't do so this year, there may be some way of in the DSA admission process to get a gauge of your ability. Uh, you could do a remote uh, demonstration uh, right. of your skills or you go to a school to do some demonstration of your skills so without competition results you can still rely on some of those uh, performances right. uh, to make some selections uh, uh, through the DSA but we thought it's important to preserve this even in the COVID years mm -hmm. as a pathway that 
recognizes talent in many areas for secondary school admission. As long as we have a way of making those assessments uh, um, uh, fairly, I yeah. think we can preserve those pathways even if there's no national competitions that can add to uh, the information that schools can consider. Right, and, and DSA of course has become a very popular route uh, with many students. It's good to see that you know uh, more students are, uh, want to be considered on these other you know, aspects rather than just academic results. Uh, it also means that they have to again think about the choice of school quite carefully, right? Indeed, uh, indeed. Whether it will nurture their, the talent that they have. Um, there's a question from a parent on why is citizenship the first tiebreaker and not choice of school? Well, I suppose this is something that uh, even in the T-score system, uh, citizenship has already been a, a, a tie-breaking uh, factor. And I suppose it, in some way it is quite logical that um, we want to make sure that uh, you know, citizenship has certain privileges okay. uh, that uh, trumps uh, your preference level of schools. So I think uh, having uh, the Singapore citizens get a priority first ahead of uh, non-citizens before uh, the factor of school choices come to play right. seems like uh, something that is aligned with this desire to recognize the, the, the privileges of citizenships. Okay. Um, another one from a parent. To be really fair, Mr. Seng, wouldn't it be better to remove all affiliation and DSA? <laughs> I, I suppose uh, this would be very divided views when it comes to issues like that. Uh, to those who don't have affiliation, of course, they see that as perhaps a more um, accessible uh, mm. outcome uh, in terms of their child's chances of getting into some of those schools with affiliation. But for those who are hoping to contribute to this family of affi affiliated schools and wanted their child to continue to enjoy that kind of ethos or culture, uh, that uh, they, they identify with. Mm -hmm. I think taking away that will also perhaps uh, cause them to feel that there's a certain sense of loss uh, right. to the ability of those affiliated schools to preserve a certain set of uh, ethos. Or, so it's, it's that delicate balance that we have to strike. I think um, uh, we are currently trying to make sure that um, we strike a good balance, right. that it is uh, still accessible to those without connections. Right. Uh, but for those who enjoy that uh, uh, ethos, that uh, affiliated schools bring, that they continue to have a chance of um, getting some priority. Yeah, okay. if, yeah. well, what about the DSC? Right. Well, <laughs> we, we really hope that uh, parents uh, see DSA for what we intend it to be, right. which is another way of recognizing talent right. and not another way of hothousing children. Yeah. Uh, so if you think that your child enjoys a particular area, let the child develop in those areas and then naturally the child would be able to access some of this DFA path, DSA pathway because his interests and his uh, uh, hobbies have been in those areas. Uh, but if we mix up the ends and the means and we right from the start, yeah. I have a school in mind, that's a DSA area that the school uh, uh, has and therefore I want to make sure that my child gets into right. some enrichment classes as early as possible in that area, regardless of his interests or That's his strength. That's not what it was meant That's for. That's really not what DSA is for. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, some kids, uh, you know, who go through the DSA route actually kind of, you know, were forced into it in a way. Uh, yeah. And they thought the school was the choice rather than wanting to develop their interests or talent and really, you know, end up uh, losing out in a way because you know they kind of uh, drift and uh, wonder what they are doing in the school. Sometimes it's too above their, uh, you know, their academic strengths. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't work out lah in the end. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, one more. Um, the new system is supposed to reduce stress on achieving specific grades. Why then is AL1 such a tough order that is 90 marks and above? Isn't this a more difficult feat? Mm. So whether AL system end up reducing stress remains to be seen. On its own, I think it's a, a, a difficult 
to bring that about if we are relying only on the changes in the scoring system. Right. But hopefully, in the context of many other shifts we make along the way, uh, collectively they make a difference to the stress level of students. Uh, but why is it that we still have this high bar of 90 marks and above scoring AL1? Yeah. Uh, why not broaden AL1 to say no 80 marks and above, you get yeah. AL1, right? I think again, if you poll the parents, the views will be very mixed. Uh, okay. Some parents would be concerned that then that it would be too much punching because if, if we say you no know, from 90 to 80, we expand the AL1 category, it means many more students will get AL1. Yep. It also means that many more students may end up getting the same PSRE score uh, mm -hmm. of maybe four uh, or, or, or five. And so that would translate into uh, uh, perhaps the need for more balloting and things like that. So, so I think, again, we're trying to strike the balance. We want to blunt the system, mm -hmm. uh, the scoring system, but not to the extent where then we have to live with many, many more the balloting uh, oh, situations. Within the same range. Yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, that is also a, a consequence of how well our students do at PSLE because many of them do well. Yeah. And so you find that at the higher mark ranges, you have to actually have um, the AL level oh, that is uh, yeah that is uh, you pack more AL level into the higher mark range because right. otherwise they will all get the same results. Okay, there's a related question. Uh, these are students who get uh, marks in the AL six seven range. Uh, parents are asking how will pupils be more motivated enough to push themselves harder to do better when the range is so wide. Mm. I think this has been a complaint yeah. since the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so because after AL4, AL5, 6, 7, 8, right, uh, actually covers a very wide mark, mark range from 74 marks all the way down. Uh, and we again have four achievement levels for that much wider mark range compared to AL1 to 4. Right. Because um, proportionally speaking, fewer students score in those mark ranges. Right. So we don't have to artificially create more levels to avoid too much punching of results. And uh, if we can, if, of course, we can choose to artificially insert more AL levels, right? And then uh, you will see that the mark range is becoming narrower. Yeah. Hopefully, to some parents, that means that my child will be motivated to strive for the next achievement level because it's now more within my reach. Instead of having to do better in maybe by 15 marks, I now only need five more marks to go to the next uh, AL6 or AL7. So we can, we can choose to do that. But we did not because we wanted to strike a balance between uh, not making the, the, the scoring systems again too fine because that, that's the purpose of us trying to go into the AL system because mm -hmm. T-score will be very fine. We didn't want the T-score that is so fine. We ended up with an achievement level that spans from 1 to 8, hopefully to blunt the, the PSRE scores. But if you again go back and insert more AL, then it seems to go against our in original intent of trying to blunt the scoring right. system. Um, but okay. I hope parents will, 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 will recognise that the way to motivate a child is not necessarily just by crossing the achievement level. Right. Even if you score from 25 marks to 35 marks, 35 marks to 40 marks, it itself actually is a growth, even if the achievement level did not change. Right. And I think it's important to help the child to find that purpose and, 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 and fulfillment in learning, not just based on what the results will Going do for them, from, yeah. but for knowing that when I put in effort, actually I get better outcomes. And when I bet better outcomes, it means actually I have understood more of the things that are going around me, whether in school life or outside. That actually a sense of growth, the sense that I, I actually can improve my performance when I put in my effort. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important uh, right. uh, motivation as opposed to uh, you know, just relying on extrinsic motivations of uh, uh, exam results. Thank you. Thank you for that advice to parents. I think parents need to hear that more often really. Uh, I, th I think that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sung, and uh, thanks to our audience for joining us this morning. Uh, I hope this session has been useful in helping you understand the new scoring system and how it may impact school postings. More importantly, I will hope it will help you make a more informed decision on schools that will suit your child. If you have friends who have missed this discussion, let them know the coverage of this event will be found in tomorrow's Sunday Times. A recording of this discussion will also be available later today on the Straits Times website. 
Do subscribe to the Straits Times Smart Parenting e-newsletter which goes out to parents every Sunday evening where I curate the content on education and parenting for the week. It is also where parents get to advance, advance notice on talks, workshops and webinars like this that we held today. If you're a subscriber to The Straits Times, you can look out for more events like this being planned for you, including one on how to prepare your child for the PSLE next year. Uh, if you're not yet a ST subscriber, well, what are you waiting for? In a moment, we will start segment two of today's program. Do click on the link that has been emailed to you to join the respective breakout sessions with principals of various secondary schools. Thank you everyone for your support. Stay safe, stay happy.